one. I was in the USAF at the time of this and was working IT and an information manager for a maintenance squadron. There were six other information managers who could have done IT, as it was a core task of our career field. None of them wanted to, and I didn't want to do paperwork, so it was a good fit. Ended up snowballing tasks and was soon in charge of doing all the AV stuff for the squadron. Christmas slides? Geowile will make them. Fundraiser? Geowile will handle it. I even ended up with a base job where I had to go to a specific location during crisis, tornadoes, if there was a base attack, etc. To do backroom IM stuff for all the big wigs of the base. I hated it. I didn't see the point of IMs there. I did the job without complaint though, it was my job. The squadron was the second largest account on the base. 650 pieces of equipment and over 200 personnel spread over multiple hangars. I was also the only IT person with a line badge, so I was allowed to freely go on the flight line without an escort. Three of our work section were on the flight line and required the badge or an escort to get to. For some reason, I rub the terrible leadership the wrong way. I generally don't take crap. If something is wrong, I speak up. I don't kiss up because I don't do the politics crap. It's a job. I do my job. Everyone should just care about their job. Politics be damned. Everyone in the squadron loved me and some places would call me Bill Gates. I was there when they called. If I couldn't fix the problem in 10 to 15 minutes, I would swap the bad equipment out. I always brought some with me. This leadership was bad. Our first sergeant was someone we called retired on active duty, a road sergeant. They don't give a crap. They're in a spot that they're comfortable in and don't care about getting the next rank, or know they've kissed up enough to skate by. For example, I'm fixing her laptop on a Friday morning. I'm bored. I don't really have anything to do for the day. Bitch, you're a first sergeant. Your job is to gauge squadron morale, know what the shops are up to. You always have something to do. Go talk to people. Because I can tell you morale sucks right now. At one point they decided it was time to catch me red-handed being lazy. The first sergeant came in and told all seven of us that we were going to track the jobs we do for the week. We're going to do this from here on out and it was directed by the group commander, Flight Squadron Group Wing, the base, command, AF wide. Okay, we doubt that, but we'll do it. I made an Excel sheet for us all to share and write down our jobs. Each information manager had their own tab and columns to fill the job, the date, the time they started it, the time they finished it. The sheet would automatically count the jobs, spit out how long it took to complete a job, and give an average time it takes to complete them. It took me all of five minutes to throw together. That week was a normal week for me. I got various calls. My account is locked out because I forgot my password. I can't access FedLog because the base IT moved the drives. So I had to remap the location so they could order parts again. My PC is messed up and won't do X. So I'd fix it or swap it out. If I swapped it, I had a bank set up with a keyboard bank so I could use one mouse and one keyboard for up to 24 PCs. I'd wait to build up at least five and reinstall Windows on them all at once. I had to delete them from the squadron's account online, then add them again after the RIS so the network would recognize them and allow it on them. I'd usually do remote work while I did this. At the end of the week, the first sergeant checked the weekly squadron commander's briefing, which was another job for me, putting together the sites for the briefing, which involved embedding an Excel document for performance reports in it, another document I managed since no one wanted to. I was waiting with giddy excitement. I knew what it was going to show. The other IMs had around 100 jobs each. Processed X decoration and award. Process X number of performance reports. Just paperwork, stuff like that. Then comes my slide. I had over 650 jobs that week. I was all over every work site. There are lots of issues with the PCs. They take some big abuse from the maintenance guys. A lot of it is because most of them suck with computers and screw stuff up. One guy had three of those malware search bar things installed somehow and couldn't understand why it was an issue. The first sergeant announced Monday morning that we were ditching the job tracking and no longer had to do it. I guess the maintenance group commander must have changed his mind in one week. 
2. This story took place in 2004. Each story about work is at a separate company. It all started when a new colleague joined our ragtag bunch of systems engineers, deploying ground-based radars around the world. From day one, I could tell there was something off about him. He had these weird mannerisms of always trying to one-up someone else's story and be the center of attention. He struck me as one of those guys who would look you in the eye and smile as he sinks the knife into your back and kiss the wound after getting what he wants. He was also one of those guys who tried to steal everyone else's thunder. Needless to say, he was overly ambitious, constantly trying to undermine me and take credit for my work. I tried to brush it off, hoping it was just a phase, but things only escalated. One day, I discovered he was spreading false rumors about me to senior management, trying to sabotage my career. Basically, this sniveling punk tried telling management I was drinking on the job, appeared high, and was very combative and threatening. And an insider threat as he saw me always carrying around external hard drives and must be selling corporate data. My manager confronted me about the rumors and told me I was on restricted duty for two weeks while they investigated. I was furious but decided to play it smart. I took PTO, vacation, for two weeks and came back to an unfounded report. Instead of confronting him directly, I started documenting everything. Every lie, every deceitful act, every instance of him trying to play games with my career. I also did something in the grey area by setting up surveillance cameras which surround my area. Think nanny cams. One day I catch him on video speaking to a competitor and divulging proprietary information without an NDA. I then heard him talking to a vendor about an all-expense paid trip to Hawaii during his vacation time for helping them make a sale with our company. Oh, that is an organizational conflict of interest, Burn. I knew I needed to act carefully. Using the company's ethics hotline, I anonymously reported his behavior, providing all the evidence I had gathered. The investigation took a few weeks, and during that time, he continued his underhanded tactics, completely unaware of the storm heading his way. Finally, the day of reckoning arrived. I was at my desk when I saw two HR representatives and a security guard walking toward him. They escorted him out of the building and as he passed by my desk, he gave me a cold, knowing stare. He knew it was me who had reported him. I stood up, looked him straight in the eyes, and said, Next time, find a toy and don't play with me. Yeah, HR did write me up for that line after taking out the trash. At the time, I thought it was well worth it. 3. I worked at a company about 15 years ago. Per diem food was $15 for breakfast, $25 for lunch, $50 for dinner. We were told to buy the food with your company card and submit photos of the receipts using your phone. One day I spent $35 on dinner, and the photo of the receipt was a little fuzzy. By the time I noticed it, when I went through the photos and assigned them to meals, I had lost the paper copy. So I got reprimanded by our VP. All photos must be clear and easy to read. He also confirmed that meals under $25 didn't need receipts. Alrighty. Before I got that email, I had thought over our per diem policy and its potential loopholes. That was the day I decided to begin exploiting it. Challenge accepted and malicious compliance begins. I have very simple tastes. Give me a flip-top can of chili and a plastic spoon and I'm fine. Plus, that way I can just go back to the hotel and rest. I didn't have to spend the time at a restaurant or hit a drive through on the way back, so about $10 a day is plenty. But the company was offering about $90 and receipts were only required for transactions over $25. So, the first day of travel I'd go to Walmart or Costco and get my food for the week. I'd do three separate transactions, one for $15, one for $25, and another for $25. That took care of my food for the week. I always went as cheap as possible. Since any extra money I spent on food, I couldn't spend on something else. Then I spent the rest of my travel days buying whatever I wanted, never spending more than $25 per transaction. Costco and Walmart were ideal. They offered cheap food, food I liked, and also all sorts of other things. I knew I couldn't be greedy. If every day I came right up to the max of each meal per diem, but not over and never submitted receipts, that would seem strange. 
so I'd ensure to bucket them into only one or two transactions per day. I did this for years, as long as each receipt added up to less than $25, and I only had one or two allocated to lunch and dinner, no one cared. For a while. Then there was an outage for an airline where I had to stay an extra week on site. I had no clean clothes, so I went and bought some clothing at Walmart. More or less as I had done before. I had a new boss and new VP by then. My new boss noticed and freaked out. He and I spent hours on the phone together, trying to slot each receipt into some acceptable category. It was hopeless, though. It was impossible to disguise those Walmart purchases by mixing them in with all my other Walmart purchases. No matter how much canned chili you eat, it's still canned chili, so I sent in my expense report in all its Walmart glory. My boss made it sound like someone would roll up to my desk with a siren on their head. But nothing came of it. I laid low for a few months and after that ate some really nice expensive meals. Then my boss got transferred. I got a new boss, who had no knowledge of this history. I went back to my old way. Over time, I bought kitchen towels, bath towels, water bottles, sippy cups for my kids, stuffed animals for my kids, books, tools, glasses, pants, shirts, jackets, a toaster, walkie-talkies for my kids, headphones, etc. And I probably saved the company a couple of hundred dollars each trip. I always came for just under a week. So, it was a win-win. Thank you for large-ass, old company. And you're welcome for my thriftiness. The money I saved you went right to the bottom line. 4. Today I was helping my parents clean out their wardrobe. It's this big wooden affair that has been in our house since before I was born. They are getting rid of it in favor of a built-in unit. I found an old backpack at the back of the wardrobe. It had probably been there for years. A lot of old stuff keeps coming out of the wardrobe since no one uses it anymore. Thing is, the backpack does not belong to me, or to any of my siblings. Rewind a few decades ago. I was in grade 6, I was 10, and I had this bully named M. M used to catch locusts, grasshoppers, you know, the big green lobster looking ones, and chase me around with them to scare me. I was and am still terrified of bugs, especially flying and hopping ones. Why do bugs have to fly? Anyway, she had been doing this since grade 4. She would either put the grasshopper in my bag or chase me with it during lunch. Once she chased me for so long, I decided to walk home instead of waiting for school to end. I told my parents. My dad, he is the rub some dirt in it kind of guy, brushed it off and asked why I was scared of grasshoppers, and explained that the bugs were probably more afraid of me than I was of them. Gee, thanks, Dad. My mother, the so-called peacekeeper, Asked what I had done to M to make her do this to me. I dreaded going to school every day and my nerves were not happy with me. You petty revenge. This is not the part where I tell a teacher, grown-ups are clearly not the answer, or the part where I go nuclear and stage an elaborate revenge. This is the part where I stole her backpack. I was ten years old and this was the most diabolical thing I could think of. Our school did not have lockers, so you had to lug all your belongings from home to school. All your belongings. The backpack had her school books, her spare cash, her bus pass. For days, our teacher asked us to help look for the backpack, as Em had no way of getting to school and back without the bus pass. No way of doing schoolwork. Since Em was notorious for scaring people with critters, the backpack was not found. Em told our class teacher that she thought it might be me, but conveniently left out why she thought it might be me. But here's the thing. I used to admit to small crimes, breaking a glass, eating the ultramel, leaving the sink running. Even when I hadn't done it to build up cred for when I committed bigger ones. Breaking a window, spilling soda on my dad's paperwork, so most grown-ups knew that I owned up to my misdoings. It wasn't hard to get the teacher to believe me. I even started crying and asking Em why she would accuse me of something so terrible. Losing one's school bag was such a terrible thing to happen, and I would never be so cruel. <laughs> she had to replace all her books and redo all her class assignments as they contributed to the report card. She also had to explain to her parents how she lost the bag in the bus pass. She got into so much trouble with the teachers and even got spanked a few times for not having her homework done. 
Anyway, clearly I never gave the backpack back. And now, I guess I will be throwing it in the trash. If you ever find this M, yes, it was me after all. Hellfreezer's note. Uh, crueler and more delicious revenge would be not to throw it out, but to firstly wipe the backpack and remove any and all traces of fingerprints, then package it up and have it anonymously delivered to them. Imagine how it might mess with their head having it just turn up with everything in there after all these years. Oh, maybe add a picture of uh, Jason Lee as Earl from My Name is Earl because, you know, karma. Five. We all do some crazy stuff when we're kids. I don't care what you say, everybody is guilty of something in that aspect. Maybe you went skinny dipping after sneaking out the house. Maybe you saran wrapped your neighbor's car from end to end after duct taping the keys to the driver's side door. All of us have done something nuts once or twice in our lives. My stepbrother is a different story. Flash forward to present day and he's become the black sheep of the family. To him, the word accountability is foreign. It always has been, and frankly, I'm not sure he'll ever truly learn the meaning of it. Throughout our preteen and teen years, we would engage in the occasional week-long prank war. Nothing too severe. We genuinely did things that would help us avoid injury and long explanations to our parents. A little shaving cream while sleeping here, some peanut butter in the receiver of the bedroom phone, and a well-timed phone call there. Just stuff that would garner a few laughs, even if it was a day or two later. But as things went on, my stepbrother's idea of a prank became far less innocent. And as I was still doing things like putting Vaseline on the bathroom doorknob, he was doing things like jamming pushpins into the toes of your running shoes. It eventually got to the point where our parents stepped in and put a stop to things, because they were justifiably concerned about an impending hospital visit in the near future. So, for about a year, things were quiet on all fronts. By this point, I was almost 16 and starting to mature. The idea of prank wars didn't really do much for me at that point, so I was mentally ready to let it be a thing of the past and focus on the more important things most 16-year-old boys deem as such. Girls and my studies. There may be a little crossover there. Little did I know the ban on pranking didn't sit well with my stepbrother. You want to know why I don't have any pictures for my spring formal dance that year? Well, I'm about to tell you. When he was told to knock it off by both my mother and his father, something snapped inside his brain. Rather than suck it up and listen, he began devising an admittedly cartoonishly evil scheme. It's the night of the dance. I'm getting ready to go out and have what I was hoping to be the time of my life that night. Never felt this way before. I'm getting ready to put on my ready tuxedo, and I lay it out on the bed. Before I get dressed, I do my normal after-school routine, and I hop in the shower. I didn't mention I was on the track team during that time of my life, and I didn't really like showering at the school. The water pressure sucked, and I could at least sing in the shower in the privacy of my own home. So I'm getting cleaned up, and I start putting shampoo in my hair. And a few seconds later, I smell something burning. Not like something in the oven, a chemical smell mixed with burning hair. And then the gravity of the situation hits me. Somebody put Nair hair remover in my shampoo. I'm panicking while rinsing the stuff out as best as I can, but by now, it is streaking down my face and getting into my eyebrows. Thankfully, it didn't get into my eyes. But it came damn close, and I don't want to think about what could have happened if that had been the case. By now I didn't care about soaping up the rest of my body. I needed to see what kind of damage I was looking at, and holy hell it was a sight. Large swaths of hair were missing from the top of my head. And what wasn't missing was starting to melt. I had what basically equated to half an eyebrow on the side of my face. The rest was gone. The thing about this Nair hair remover is that essentially it melts the hair down to the root, so you can just basically wipe it off with a damp washcloth. My stepbrother had essentially turned me into a 16-year-old member of the hair club for men. Oh, but it gets better. As I was in the shower, I would later come to find out he had tampered with my rental tux. How so? 
He watered down some Elmer school glue, you know, that white pasty stuff in the bottle with the orange-tipped pencil-style dispenser. For the short time I was in the shower, he decided to thin it out and splash it all over the groin and inner thigh of my tuxedo pants to make it look like a certain bodily fluid. I was freaking the hell out at this point. My scalp was still burning from the chemicals because that doesn't go away for a while. And the hair that at this point was almost shoulder length and normally pulled back into a ponytail was absolutely done for. I'm screaming at the top of my lungs and crying my eyes out because this wasn't a prank, this was humiliation. Phil, my stepbrother with a cro magnon brain, stood at the end of the hallway surveying the damage he did while chuckling like a cracked out hyena. I swear I could almost hear his caveman inner monologue saying, <laughs> Feel you funny. <laughs> you know who wasn't laughing other than myself? Our parents? The first one to respond to the clear commotion coming from my room was my stepdad. He sees me standing there in the state I was in, and the look on his face was indescribable. I say that, but I'll still give it my best shot. It was like a cross between realization and horror, anger and sadness. He knew that I was looking forward to this dance for quite some time. He knew that I'd worked up the courage to ask the girl I liked to go with me. Hell, he even fronted me the $75 tuxedo rental cost. Because he was so proud of me for not only asking this girl out, he was proud of me because I'd been busting my butt that year and keeping my grades up. I don't think too much time passed before he suddenly started sniffing the air and he almost immediately recognized the smell. It wasn't seven layers, and that beaver wasn't eating Taco Bell. It was the very same hair remover my mother used on her legs. I mean, whenever she used it, he would casually complain about the stench. More often than not, I would find him sitting in the living room, thumbing through a magazine or reading a book, while my mother was taking care of that task. He walked into my room and gave my hair a sniff. The sight alone was confirmation, but I guess he had to be sure. He then gets a look at the rental tux he'd helped pay for, and he notices his son's handiwork starting to dry on the leg. He turned red as Satan's gooch and then called for my mom. She comes barreling into my room thinking I was hurt or something, and it takes a little less time to realize exactly what was going on. She smelled her hair remover, saw the top of my head, and it was almost as if my stepfather and my mother's complexions were in competition with one another. Get Philip, get him in here now. We're going to get to the bottom of this one way or another. My stepdad with a scowl on his face as he nods in agreement. Philip immediately knew what was going to happen once I started my little freakout session. And so he made it a point to practically barricade himself in his room. My mom is hugging me about the possible humiliating scenario I would have to endure in school while my hair grew back is running through my head. I watch as my stepdad walks out the kitchen and gets a screwdriver, which he uses to pop my stepbrother's lock and push his door open. Within seconds, he has my stepbrother by the ear and he's leading him into the room. This, this, please don't tell me this is your idea of a joke. My stepbrother looks down at the floor sheepishly and he just mumbles to his dad. I don't know what you're talking about. My mother chimes in. If you don't know what he's talking about, then why did you lock yourself in your room? I thought I was running low on hair remover a couple of days ago. The funny thing is, I just bought that bottle over the weekend. I hadn't even gotten into it yet. Don't move from that spot till I get back. I watch as my mother kicks it up a gear as she walks into both her bathroom and the one across the hall from my bedroom. In her hand, she has the Nair bottle and the dark blue bottle of cheap shampoo I usually used. She opens up the hair remover first and sees it's about half empty before giving the shampoo a sniff test. The look on her face said it all. He was caught dead to rights. My stepfather was not one to lose his cool. I never saw him put his hands on his child in any other manner that could be described as supportive or loving. He slapped the ever-loving crap out of my stepbrother in what would be the first and only time I would ever see him do it. My stepbrother stood there for a moment, absolutely reactionless. I think he was in just as much shock as the rest of us. My stepdad then takes a moment to point to the tuxedo. That better not be what it looks like on those tuxedo pants. 
At this point, I think my stepdad wasn't willing to put anything past his son after he melted off my hair with his innocent little prank. My stepbrother put up his hands and shook his head no while telling my stepdad, It's just what is down now, Monk's glue. It's not at all what it looks like. I mean, it would have looked like that if it had dried at the dance, but it should come out. Stepdad starts rubbing his hand over his face. Philip, you absolute tool. You know just as well as I do that was a rental tuxedo. That had better come out. Spoiler alert, it didn't. At least not all the way. And when my stepdad and I went to return the tuxedo, the department store we rented it from didn't buy the whole it's just watered down Elmer's glue explanation. They charged my stepdad full price for the tux. So, a summer job and 400 plus dollars later, Philip ended up buying me a tuxedo with his actions. Back to the chaos unfolding in my room. My mother has finally calmed me down, and she's basically getting a better look at the damage done. I had no choice but to shave my head, and after she wiped my face, my eyebrows were almost completely gone. I looked like a teenage Uncle Fester. I was too humiliated to go to the dance. I ended up calling the girl I was supposed to take, and before I could even finish explaining the situation, she royally chewed me out over the phone. She told me she knew she was taking a chance on me and couldn't believe she got all dressed up for nothing. I didn't get a word in edgewise. She abruptly hung up on me, and with that, my night had gone from destroyed to decimated. I collapsed to the floor and sat there back against the wall, face in hands once again crying. This time the tears were from sheer disappointment and anger. My stepdad said absolutely nothing, just pointed to my stepbrother's room, and off he went while giving me a wide berth. My stepdad sat on the floor next to me and put an arm around my shoulder. I'm sorry, bud. That wasn't just a joke. It was absolutely cruel. I don't know what got into him. I know you were looking forward to this, and I'm sorry it turned out this way. Something tells me karma is going to catch up to him. About that last part, he gave me a nudge like a playful elbow to the arm. And when I looked up at him, he gave me a wink and a nod. Did my stepdad just give me the green light to get back at his son? Why, well, I believe he did, and eventually I would do just that. By now my mother had already taken me to the side and told me she was in on it. She knew that I would get back at him in one way, shape, or form, and as long as I didn't go to the extreme he did, she would look the other way. So I bided my time. And when I say I waited patiently, I mean I waited a couple of years. My stepbrother had all but forgotten the horrendous prank he pulled on me, but I didn't. In that couple of years since he pulled that little stunt, a few things happened. I moved in with a couple of childhood friends shortly after high school. I was finding myself, managed to land a good job, even started dating a girl who came from a family of pharmacists and herself was studying to be one. My stepbrother, on the other hand, who I neglected to mention was almost two years older than me, was still living at home and has been on the wrong side of the law a few times. Most of the stuff was innocuous, a speeding ticket here, a parking violation there, but he did end up getting charged with a misdemeanor assault charge after getting into a drunken scuffle with some rando in a dive bar parking lot. This landed him visits with a probation officer that would make the occasional house call. He didn't just show up out of the blue, he would usually call to let my stepbrother know he was coming by and to be home at the time. On top of all this, he was juggling two girlfriends like he was trying out for the circus. This, of course, was before the days of highly accessible social media. I knew his girlfriend at the time, and I didn't know about the infidelities right away. As a matter of fact, they seemed to be in a fairly healthy relationship because she quite frequently called him out on its crap. Looking back on this, I honestly feel as if he had a side chick. Good God, I hate that term. Because she didn't allow him to go all out and show his true colors. I only learned about the second girl, quite literally, the day I planned to get my revenge. I made it a point to go visit my parents that day, and as the three of us are sitting there in the living room just chatting about life, Philip gets a call from his PO, informing him that he needed to stay put until around 4 p.m., my stepbrother acknowledged he would do so, and this is what set the gears in motion. It was a little after two and my stepbrother was looking for something to eat in the kitchen. 
He made himself a liverwurst sandwich and left it on the counter as he ran to the bathroom to take a leak. Not only did he leave the sandwich on the counter, but he left the bottle of blue Gatorade he'd been working on throughout the course of the morning as well. This is when I grabbed my goodie bag of vengeance from the courier bag I was carrying around at the time. Step 1. I don't recommend trying this if the person you're trying to prank has an allergy to shellfish. It could have dire consequences. But methylene blue is not only a medication used to treat certain blood disorders, it's also a non-toxic fish tank cleaner that is readily available at most pet supply chains. Remember how I mentioned my girlfriend at the time's parents were pharmacists? They told me all about how they used this to prank a co-worker once, and I retained every single sliver of information. Two drops in the Gatorade, pick it up and give it a good shake to mix in. And wait. Step 2. Remove the bread from the bottom side of the sandwich and squeeze a generous amount of anchovy paste into said sandwich. Wait for my stepbrother to take a bite. He hates fish. Step 3. Utilizing a bit of chemical warfare, mix a small amount of Anbasol toothache gel and Preparation H hemorrhoid cream with a bit of water. Mix until soluble. Step 4. With the assistance of a hypodermic needle I got from my diabetic mother, inject set mixture into the tip of the toothpaste tube. Step 5. Try not to smile like the lead singer of Disturbed and contain myself while the chaos unfolds. Once he goes into the bathroom, I take the maybe two minutes I have and use him wisely. I complete four of the five steps, and as I get ready, there's a knock at the door. I look at the clock and realize it's far too early for his probation officer to show up, so I answer it. I'm taken aback when I see none other than Melanie standing in the doorway. She honestly hadn't changed much since high school. A slightly different hairstyle and a lip piercing. But she almost looked the same. Hey Melanie, long time no see. What brings you my way? She gives me this kind of sideways glance. Is Phil here? I need to see him. I nod yes, and tell her he is currently indisposed. And then I ask her if she wants to come in. She says yes, and I invite her in. She takes a minute to sit down, and she looks at me like she wants to say something. She has kind of a look of disdain on her face. I never got the chance to tell her what happened that night, and at this point I figured she'd let it go. But now that she was sitting more or less face to face with me, it was like those feelings came flooding back. Look, if you're up for it, we'll talk later. I have a lot to tell you. But right now I'm in the middle of something. Philip should be out of the bathroom by now. He was going to go to the kitchen and eat his lunch. She got up from the easy chair in the living room and made her way to the kitchen. She breezed right past me and sat at the table across from Philip. She had a look on her face that screamed urgency. But Philip, being the oblivious reservoir tip escapee, he is just ignored her. She tried getting through to him over and over when she finally produces an envelope from her purse and puts it down on the kitchen table. I don't know how I ended up with this, but you're paying for the medical bill. This look of shock momentarily washes over his face. I have no clue what you're talking about, he says to her. I see her face contort like a villain in an anime reaching their final form. She makes a feeble attempt to keep her voice quiet, but the rage is there. I don't hear everything she says, but I do hear the word gonorrhea. They're having a whisper a quiet argument at the table, and I'm hearing every third word, and that's when it happens. He finally picks up the sandwich and takes a bite. He's chewing, and I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. This actually comes to be a bit of a bonus, because as they're arguing, he just keeps on eating, and it doesn't hit him until he's almost completely done with the sandwich. It just doesn't seem to taste right. He grabs the Gatorade and chugs the roughly half a bottle left when it hits him. These two tastes clash terribly. Maybe I should go brush my teeth. I'm pretty sure I was smiling like a gremlin when I see him rush to the bathroom and grab that tube of toothpaste. He starts brushing frantically. Not just his teeth, but his entire mouth. And he's doing this for like a solid five minutes. While Melanie is... Sitting at the table, I give her an abridged version of what's about to happen. Her attitude changes. She starts smiling and watching alongside me, and while we're waiting for the chaos to completely unfold, I explain to her what happened on that night. 
I get as much detail in as possible while we have that little bit of free time. She sighs, looks at me, rubs my shoulder and apologizes. Makes sense now. You know my parents couldn't stand you because they thought you stood me up for the longest time. Until they hear this. But first, let's enjoy the show. You know he has a girlfriend, right? I asked her. Her eyes widen and she looks at my direction. No. No, I did not. She says in this malicious yet sing-song voice. I motion for her to follow me into the den for a moment when I pull up my MySpace profile. Yes, it was that long ago. Go to his girlfriend, she was one of my top five, and show her close to a year of photos featuring the two of them together in both casual and romantic situations. The earliest was only a couple of days old. She makes her way over to the couch and sits down, visibly fighting back tears. The proof was in the pudding, and in all honesty, I would have told her regardless of whether or not we were in the middle of a revenge scenario. Well, now I'm really going to enjoy this. The timing couldn't have been any more perfect. Philip comes out of the bathroom, and as he does so, I close the internet tab with my profile pulled up. I quickly open up Google. He goes to make some sort of comment, but it comes out all slurred. He starts drilling on himself and freaking out. When we get another knock at the door. It's his probation officer. I invite him in, and Philip is standing there with a look of terror plastered on his face. The probation officer goes to speak with him, and when he hears the slurred speech and sees him drooling all over himself, he tells Phil he's going to make a drug test on the spot. This is where the methylene blue comes into play. The probation officer went out to his car and comes back with a cup and some testing strips. He informs Philip he's going to follow him to the bathroom and watch him pee into the cup. And when he does so, I hear an audible, What the hell? Almost in unison coming from the bathroom. Methylene blue has a side effect, one that I opted to leave out until now. When it hits the bladder, it reacts with chemicals in the urine. This in turn makes the person who consumes said chemical urinate a continuous stream of Windex minus the smell until it's out of their system. As the probation officer is standing there scratching his head and wondering what illicit substance my stepbrother consumed to have a side effect like this, I let him have it. Remember when you put Nair in my shampoo and ruined my rental tux the night of the dance? Do you honestly think I forgot about that? I want you to remember this exact moment the next time you think you're going to pull an innocent prank that causes me to lose all my hair and my eyebrows. I know how to be patient. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Screw with me again. See what happens. I tell the probation officer what's actually happening, that I'd put toothache gel and hemorrhoid cream into his toothpaste, and the reason he was peeing blue was due to a couple of drops of fish tank cleaner. Once the officer realized what exactly was going on and that my stepbrother was getting his comeuppance, he laughed hysterically before saying, Okay, so your stepbrother is suffering from sleep deprivation, because there is no way you would admit to dosing your stepbrother with anything. Even though he was willing to overlook it this one time, I took it as a warning for the future. The probation officer stood up, shook his head, and continued to laugh before saying he would come back tomorrow at the same time. No drug test needed. As he was getting ready to leave, Melanie stood up and said, Oh, he's not just suffering from being pranked, he's also suffering from a breakup. Philip's eyes shot back and forth like he was a little kid getting caught opening up his Christmas presents in July. I know about the other girl, Philip. I know that you've been in a relationship for over a year. I was going to mention that before the probation officer showed up. I found her MySpace profile. You're going to take care of the problem in that envelope or I'm going to take you to court and make it well known throughout town. And with that, the two of them walked out the door. I looked at Philip with the most evil and satisfied grin I've ever managed to produce. I then tell him to go ahead and try something because I got the green light from our parents. Melanie and the probation officer just happened to be a bonus. He never messed with me again from that point forward. And it turns out a bunch of other things come out in the laundry, so to speak. He was sleeping around town with multiple women. He ended up paying for several medical bills on top of Melanie's. He later admitted to more than likely getting that STI from a neighbor's wife, who was known for being a bit on the promiscuous side. It's largely due to all this he ended up becoming the aforementioned black sheep of the family. Not many of us speak to him anymore, unless we absolutely have to. 
I can't honestly say he's doing any better today. He more or less got ran out of town and moved out of state. Sadly, it's well known that he's making the same mistakes there too. He's a jackass. But he's family. My main concern is that he's going to get a karma call from somebody who isn't willing to numb his mouth and make him pee blue. But he's an adult making adult decisions and playing adult games. There's no getting through to him. But as far as that day is concerned, it felt like... Well, to borrow an album title from My Chemical Romance, Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge's Ice Cream, episode 367. And thanks a lot to everybody who allowed me to use and sent in stories for use in this video. You can send your own stories along to kingofthecities at gmail.com. If you want early access to these stories, then you get that through my Patreon, which is linked in the description, as is a link to the Discord server and the merchandise store. If you want to leave a tip, then do that by clicking on the heart with the dollar sign underneath the video. And while that is never required, I very much appreciate the help, and it's kept me going a lot longer than I thought. Okay, no other business today, so let's see. Let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... What is your favorite uh, non-dairy milk? Or if you couldn't get it anymore, if you uh, understand, you know... Regular cow's milk is, is generally nicer, but if you couldn't have that anymore, which would be your preference? There's a few I like. I generally go with either oat, almond, or there's also a, a rice milk, which is quite nice. And those are the kind of three I tend to rotate between, depending on what's available in the stores I'm shopping in. So, why don't you let me know what you think in a comment below. And before we go, let's have the answer of the day from a previous video. And this was from Revenge's Ice Cream 364, and was about personal projects you just can't let go. And today's answer comes from Enza Sierra. I must finish building my compiler. Ever since I took a class on compilers, I have wanted to build on, but it is quite a task to do so. And thank you very much for your answer, Enza. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.